Good morning, grace and peace to you. Welcome to worship on a sunny, not icy or snowy, January Sunday. We are thankful that you are with us. A couple of announcements. There is an annual meeting this morning immediately following the service. And so for those of you online, I hope that you have your annual reports and will join us on Zoom. That will not be on Facebook Live. Or if you still have time, you can join us in person. In two weeks, we are going to celebrate Super Sunday. It has been a couple of years since we were together eating soup. Last year, if you recall, we gathered soup cans, and that was awesome, but not quite as much fun as sitting together and eating. And so we will sit together and eat. There is a sign-up sheet in the back if you would like to participate by making something. Otherwise, this is a free and open invitation. We want you to come and eat. You don't have to sign up for that. You just show up and have some soup. Speaking of eating, we have a conversation that is happening at 5 o'clock on Sundays right now around a curriculum called Just Eating with a question mark. Are we just eating when we gather together? You are invited to join us this evening at 5 for that. February is our, this, the mission for February is going to be our bottle caps. As most of you are aware, we have a gorgeous bench out front that is made of our bottle caps that have been collected. We are working towards some picnic benches to replace the old ones that have served us wonderfully well for a very long time, but are starting to wear. And so, one of the things that has to happen is we don't just collect the bottle caps. They have to be sorted, they have to be checked to make sure that they're the right kind of caps, and they have to be clean. That process is a little time consuming and has been being done, but the two folks who have done most of it over the past two years have been overrun by bottle caps, so we're gonna help. And so starting in February, actually starting today, there are stations set up downstairs, there are instructions, and Michael Swearingen is an expert in telling you which caps are good and which ones are not. And so if you want to pop in during the week and sort some caps, you're welcome to do that. If you want to stay after on a Sunday or come early for Rev and sort some caps, you are welcome to do that. But our hope is to get through the overflow uh, in the month of February. Are there any other announcements this morning as we prepare for worship? Then will you join me in our call for worship? Jesus invites us. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Gather us in, join our hearts together, and renew us again in worship, O Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, you have loved us with a love that will not let us go. Though we have wandered and sometimes been lost, you seek us out and call us back to you. As we enter into worship today, reclaim again our hearts that we might be full of love for you and our neighbor. Amen. We're going to sing together, Come, Christians. Join to sing. Would you stand as you are able, and let us sing together.
may be seated. People of God, our Lord Jesus taught us, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. But then he said, a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. It is on these two commandments that all the law and the prophets depend. As God's people, we are aware of how often we have fallen short from these commandments and how we are in need of forgiveness. And so let us confess our sins together. Would you join me in our prayer of confession? There are many times we think we love you well, O oh God, but upon hearing your call to love you with all our heart and all our mind and all our strength, we confess that our love for you is deluded love, made insipid and flat by lesser loyalties and a divided heart. Our love seems pure only for brief moments. Soon our affections are drawn away. How easily our devotion dies. Forgive us in deep mercy and grace. Rekindle our love for you in seeing anew Jesus' love for us. Amen. People of God, then hear these words. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but might have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Believe this good news and be at peace. We have been working our way through 1 Corinthians. If you have been in worship or joined us online, you know that we spent two weeks reading a passage that talks about spiritual gifts and their use in the body. And then at the end of the passage last week, Paul concluded, but strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. With that as our framework, let's hear what he says about the more excellent gifts. This is 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love.
Our gospel today is a continuation, again, of last week. Jesus has returned to Nazareth. Jesus is back in his hometown, in his home church, so to speak. He stood up to read, and he read from the prophet Isaiah. And then he rolled it up, and he handed it back. And then he sat down. And began to say to them, Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Isn't this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do also here in your own hometown the things that we have heard that you did in Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah. And when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, there was a severe famine in the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of these except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, 
the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill upon which the town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the, their midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning we've read what seemed like two completely different passages of scripture, didn't we? The story of Jesus in his own hometown, proclaiming and defining his call, what he understands his mission is, and then angering the people of town so much that they are ready to throw him off a cliff. And what is referred to as the love chapter in Corinthians. Hurling the wonder kid of the community off a cliff hardly sounds like love, does it? So then what are we to make of these two passages? Are they related at all? Other than both being in our Bible, do they have anything to do one with the other? Can we find any connection at all? The love chapter is one of the most quoted passages of scripture. It's right up there with the Lord is my shepherd and the Lord's prayer. The love chapter is read at weddings. I've read it at funerals. It is written on home decorations. It is quoted all over the place, even places who maybe don't even know where it's from. But this is the danger, isn't it? This passage could easily slide into being cliche, relegated to the realm of weddings and romantic love misses the point of this chapter because Paul isn't preaching to a couple getting married. Paul is writing to a church about how it is they should be in community. While this chapter does stand alone, it does. Corinthians chapter 13 stands by itself as a wonderful statement of what it looks like to love. But it also comes after the earlier pieces of the letter. And there is more that follows. It doesn't just get plucked out. It stands in with all of these other things. If we're really going to understand what Paul meant by love, we have to hold in our minds what he also has been saying about being a part of the body of Christ. What it means to be and use spiritual gifts, gifts that each of us are given. That it is out of our belovedness. It is out of God's great love for us that we are gifted and that we are asked to use those gifts with love towards others. The point that overarches all of Paul's piece of this letter is that love is supposed to govern everything. Love must be grown and shaped in us as we serve God and each other. Paul sees love as the antidote to infighting, factionalism, and division, which was rampant in the Corinthian church. Paul sees love as the foundation of faith and the Christian life. As such, love is not a feeling. Love is a way of living. It's a way of being as a disciple. Love is not another spiritual gift that some people have and other people didn't get. Love isn't like preaching or teaching or hospitality. Love is intended to be a way of life. Love is the calling of the church as a whole. It's the foundation of faith and hope, the way of living in spiritual connection as the body of Christ. The individual gifts are to be used with love and in love towards one another 
and for the purpose of the church in the world. Paul's intent is to help us understand how we should be together, not merely as family units, but as a community of believers in the body of Christ. Everyone receives spiritual gifts that are intended to be used for the community, for the building up of the kingdom of God. In the body of Christ, every gift is necessary. Every individual has a purpose. Everyone is necessary. In the body of Christ, we are supposed to start with love. It's love that binds us together and helps us to imagine a greater good, a good beyond our own self-interest. Love operates as the foundation of the body, according to Paul, which means that love isn't feeling warm and fuzzy towards someone. Love is acting for the good of another person. It's not something that you just feel. Love is something you act on or act in. It's something we choose to do and be. We choose to be loving. It is the faithful response of what God has done for us. It's out of love for God, love for ourselves, love for our neighbor that we step out and serve God. It's out of love that we try and do what's best for each other and to do the right, next most faithful thing. To love well, to do it right, we need character formation, right? We don't just suddenly one day decide, I'm going to love people. We need help practicing that love, especially the people we disagree with particularly the people that we don't understand or the people that we experience as being really hard to love. Love doesn't just spring up from the ground. It has to be planted in us. It has to be practiced and nurtured and cared for. And in this passage, Paul is making the case that love is supposed to be nurtured and grown and encouraged and strengthened in the body of Christ. That the church is the place of cultivation. That the church is the place where we learn habits and practices that increase our ability to act with love, even with those that we don't like today. The body of Christ is supposed to be where we learn to live and act in love. So then let's go back to Jesus in Nazareth. Let's go back as Jesus sits in his home community where he learned the law, where he learned how to read the scripture that he just stood up and read to them. What is happening? Why is everybody so suddenly angry with him? Jesus' fame has spread. Jesus, in Capernaum and other communities in Galilee, is doing amazing things. He is working miracles, casting out demons. He is preaching and teaching, and he's even got his own squad now. He has just chosen 12 disciples. Jesus now travels with an entourage of people who are learning at his feet. And he's come home. The hometown kid. Here's somebody special. He comes home and he stands up to read and we're told that everyone is amazed at how well he does. You can almost hear his old Sunday school teacher, only it wasn't Sunday school, it was something else. You can almost hear his teacher beaming with pride, whispering to a neighbor, I taught him that. He got that from me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, 
and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. When he sits down, he says, Scripture, this scripture has been fulfilled in your presence. This is Jesus saying exactly who he is, exactly why God sent him as God's son. And we are told that the crowd is amazed and impressed. And then something happens. There's a shift in the tone of the people who are listening and watching Jesus. They're waiting for something to happen, and he's just sitting there. And so they begin to doubt. Somebody says, isn't this just Joseph's son? Isn't he just the son of the carpenter? Where did he learn any of this? And so the crowd waits. They wait for him to do the amazing things he's done in other places. They wait for him to prove to them who he is, to show them what it is that he could do. Even as they begin to doubt and wonder, even as their cynicism starts to rise. As if reading their minds, Jesus starts talking about all of the times God has chosen someone else to receive blessings. All of the times that God has chosen to work in unexpected ways. All of the times that God has chosen the poor or the foreigner or the outsider. In essence, Jesus tells them that just because the scripture has been fulfilled in their presence doesn't mean they're going to believe it. What they see before them is the son of a carpenter. What does he know about God's will? What they see before him is someone whose family is sitting on the benches beside them. How can he claim to speak for God? Who is this man, really? The mood shifts as they struggle to wrap their minds around expectations. They want Jesus to prove himself, to show them, to make it visible. But their lack of faith means that they probably wouldn't believe it even if he did. Their inability to see causes them to doubt. Their status as his hometown doesn't mean that they get special status or blessing. Jesus says, I'm here to do God's will, not what you expect of me. And they are enraged. They react. The people of Nazareth can't see God working in their midst because they see a carpenter's son. They can't hear the good news that Jesus is proclaiming, that the world is going to be turned upside down, that God's favor has come because they are expecting something else. The issue lies not in the words or inaction of Jesus, but in his hearers. They are tied to old expectations of who this Messiah is going to be, their assumptions of how God acts in the world, the way things are going to go, and because God is doing something different, they can't wrap their minds around it. They fail to trust that it's pop that God could do something new. So what does that have to do with love? What does it have to do with the love chapter? How many times have you reacted with anger or maybe even lashed out at someone because they didn't fulfill your expectations? They didn't do the thing you thought they were supposed to do. How many times? Have we cried out to God because we didn't get what we wanted, expected, or assumed was going to happen? How often 
have we become resigned or cynical when things didn't go the way that we thought they should? Or how many times did we assume that they would go badly because we just figured it was better not to get our hopes up? How many times have we experienced a failure of imagination, been unable to see or hear something that was going on because our expectations didn't match what was happening? How many times do you suppose we have been guilty on turning our backs on love offered because it was unexpected? or because it didn't look like the expression of love that we thought it should be. And so because it wasn't what we expected, we couldn't see it. You see, love cannot be forced. If you impose your love on someone else, it ceases to be love, doesn't it? Jesus loves his hometown. Jesus loves the people of Nazareth. He returns to them to share with them the good news. But they can't receive it. And he will not force them to. Jesus acts with love towards this community that raised him. And when he is rejected, he doesn't condemn them. He doesn't cast fire and brimstone or even shake the dust off his sandals. Rather, we're told he passes through them and goes on his way. Love acts for the good of another. Love, even when it is hard or painful, even when the other might not be thrilled with us, is acting for the good of another. Love matters Choosing to live in love matters. We are called to live lives that are centered on love as disciples of Jesus. In Jesus, we have a living and breathing example of what it looks like to live in love, even when that love is not accepted. This is who we are called to be as Christ's body. Paul tells us it's not living if we're not doing it in love, that lacking in love in one area affects the whole of our lives. As disciples of Christ, we are called to be Christ's body everywhere we go, to be followers of Jesus in all of the places that we frequent, to act with love in all of the places that we spend time and energy. That means that I am a part of the body of Christ, whether I am here or at home, but also in the car behind the person who is not paying attention to what they should be doing. Or in the grocery store when someone has been rude or when the cashier is sullen because they just got yelled at by someone else and on and on. We are a part of the body of Christ in all of the places that we go. If we take seriously this call to act with love, to be loving, then the love needs to be the foundation of how we choose to be in this world in all of the places that we go. We must learn to act with love in all places and in all times. And we do that by practicing here. We do that by practicing in places where it is safer. And then we do it by practicing out in the world and coming back and getting a little bit of encouragement. Amen.
people of God, are there joys or concerns that you have to share with one another this morning? Yes, ma'am. So safe travel, rejoicing, time with a grandson, which is awesome, but also prayers for Jason, who is dealing with the beginnings of Parkinson's. Other things? grab-and-go cupcake for you in the back. Thank you. And apparently Rick doesn't need the microphone anymore. Jenny. Mm-hmm. That's the Benedict. No. So Helen and Tony, who are hopefully coming home, but who are deeply struggling, and for their family who's caring for them. Other things? And people of God, let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, on this day when we gather to sing your praises, to enjoy the sunshine, to be together, we give you thanks that you are a God who gives us love and who loved us before We knew how to love. We give you thanks that you teach us and call us to be people who act with love because you loved us before we knew ourselves. And so we give you thanks today for the people who have loved us and cared for us and nurtured us, for the people who have encouraged us and challenged us throughout our lives for those who are no longer with us, and for those who we can still embrace. We give you thanks, O God. Lord God, we pray for this world. We pray for the needs of our community and for the needs of those around our world. We pray for those who are sick. We lift up to you Brianne's mom and Liz, We lift up to you Jason and Shannon and Helen and Tony. Lord God, we know that you know better than we what is needed and what is to be done. And so we ask, Lord, that you would be the great physician, that you would give healing and strength. Lord God, we give you thanks for safe travel. We pray for those who are on roads that are not clear. We pray for those who are digging out, for those who are bracing for the next storm. In this time of year, Lord, we are always grateful when we can get from one place to another safely. Lord God, we pray also for those who are grieving, for those who have lost those that they love. We pray in particular today for Virginia, but we pray also, Lord, for others who sit heavy on our hearts, who long for and have lost those that they love. So we ask, Lord, that you would give comfort and strength. As we enter into our annual meeting, 
God, we ask your blessing, your wisdom, and your guidance as we seek to be a part of the body of Christ. Here on this corner, here in Hickory Hills, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to discern, that you would give us wisdom and courage and energy and strength. We pray all of this in the name of the one who came, the one who offered himself for us all. And we pray the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, if you are able, let us stand and sing together, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
people of God, our annual meeting is today, and we set the time for that meeting to begin in six minutes. So here is what we're going to do. If you are not a member of this church and do not wish to stay for the meeting, go in peace. We love you. We are thankful that you are here. You are welcome to stay. It is not a closed meeting. But if you need to go, we invite you to go ahead and scoot out, grab a treat on your way. The rest of you who are members, I'm sorry, I really do need you to stay because I need a quorum. But you have five minutes to stretch, use the restroom, and get back in here. We will begin our meeting at 11. Go in peace. We will conclude the service as we conclude our meeting. Okay?